This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Verses 6 to 16. You'll find that on page 290 of the Bibles in the pews. First Samuel chapter 18, beginning at verse 6. These are God's words. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil or harmful spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. So he went with David, or so he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. We're going to end our reading there. May God bless his word to us. Rubina. Well, let's continue our Bible reading as uh, we turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 17, where Stephen uh, left off. And we've got this... uh, uh, fraught relationship between King Saul and David. So we're going to read a little bit more about that in page 290. 1 Samuel 18, verse 17. All Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaign. Saul said to David, here is my elder daughter Merab, I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. But David said to Saul, Who am I and what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Merab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, She was given in marriage to Adriel of Mehalah. So much for that promise. Now Saul's daughter Michal was in love with David, and when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him, so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, Now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. Then Saul ordered his attendants, speak to David privately and say, Look, the king is pleased with you and his attendants all like you. Now become his son-in-law. They repeated these words to David. But David said, Do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. When Saul's servants told him what David had said, Saul replied, Say to David, 
The king wants no other price for the bride and a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. When the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So before the allotted time elapsed, David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented the full number to the king so that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter, Michal, loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him. And he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David, but Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Well, you may find it helpful to have page 290 open. That is Tate and Brady's version of Psalm 34. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience will decide how blessed are they and only they who in the Lord confide. Fear Him, you saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Make serving Him your sole delight. Your wants shall be His care. Father God, this is what we ask that this may increasingly become our felt and real experience. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So, in today's Scripture reading, 1 Samuel 18, we have a stark contrast between Saul on his way out as king and David in his way in as king. Saul, yesterday's man, David, tomorrow's man. Saul, as someone who had an evil spirit controlling him. David, who had the Holy Spirit controlling him. The contrast is so plain that verse 12 tells us, uh, not as we might expect that David was afraid of Saul, but Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. There are two sorts of fear, the sort that runs away from God, that is repulsed by God, and the sort that runs to the Lord, that is attracted to the Lord. There's the sort of sinful, jealous fear which King Saul had of David, verse 9, which drives people away from God. And there's the sort of filial fear which David had towards the Lord, which gave him poise, the calm, and a dignity leading to life and hope and peace. And it's vital for us to discern the difference. Look at Saul, Saul who was afraid of David, Look at what that fear motivated him to do against God's anointed. Saul had a spear in his hand, verse 10, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Secondly, Saul sent David away from him, verse 13, and gave him command over a thousand men. But instead of getting killed on the battlefield in everything he did, David had great success. Thirdly, then, Saul offered the hand of his eldest daughter, Merib, to David in marriage. 
If only he served him bravely in his battles, but instead of honoring his word, he played with David's emotions by marrying his daughter off to someone else. And then fourthly, Saul then offered the hand of his next daughter, Michal, to David in marriage so that she might, verse 21, be a snare to him. But again, instead of falling at the hands of the enemy, verse 25, David triumphed over the Philistines, causing Saul, please note in verse 29, to become even more afraid of David, remaining so for the end of his days. So here's a man who hates David, not simply because he's good, but in him he sees what he could have been, but failed to be. Jealousy is an awful thing, and when it leads to hatred, evil intent, or fear, it's neither good for the individual themselves nor for those around. And it is only the Holy Spirit can enable jealousy to be eradicated, as it surely must. Now, contrast that with David, God's anointed his only fear was of the Lord and his reputation. Do you remember last week how David was appalled at the way the Philistine Goliath defied the living God? And his chief concern was to honor God's holy name among the nations. So David's fear was motivated by a filial desire to love and magnify and glorify the overwhelmingly incomparable covenant God whose glorious reputation was at stake. For when you fear him, you saints, you have nothing else to fear. And when a person fears God rather than anything else, then two amazing things happen. When you fear only the Lord, first of all, your head is neither carried away by praise, nor secondly, are you devastated or crushed by disappointment. Can you see how Saul was desperately affected by both of those things? He yearned for popularity and was distressed by insecurity. But because David was grounded in the Lord, and controlled by his Holy Spirit, David's equilibrium was neither thrown or uh, put into turmoil when the women came out and loudly sang and danced to his praise, verse 6, nor was he overwhelmed when his father-in-law set a trap for him in order to take his life. Because David's heart was postured towards the Lord, in the words of Rudyard Kipling, he was able to treat those two impostors, triumph and disaster, just the same. Now, let's be clear. We're not saying that David was never affected by what people thought of him. Clearly not. He wasn't a robot. But what we are noting is that his relationship with the Lord was neither dependent upon human accolade nor harmed by personal criticism. And never is this more important to note than during this era of social media, where one devastating comment, let alone concerted bullying, can cause our young people to descend into utter misery. Fear him, you saints, and you'll have nothing else to fear. And so, young people, may I say this loud and clear, your worth is not dependent on what people say or think about you. Your worth is dependent on what the Lord thinks of you. And He thinks you are so valuable that God sent His only Son to be your Savior, and you only say valuable things. So please note this well. When your attention is focused less on me 
and what I have or have not done, and more on Him and who He is and what He has done, then your head is neither carried away by praise, nor are you devastated or crushed by disappointment. Very shortly, we're going to come to the Lord's table. And each of one of us, I guess, will come with our own fair share of anxieties and fears, our distractions and concerns. We come as people conscious of our own human pride and personal vulnerability, our hurts and our pains. We come as people in need of forgiveness, mercy, equilibrium, and calm. How good it is, then, to know that we come to the one to whom David pointed, who takes our sinful, selfish fears, our cruel and pitiless idols, and by the power of the cross meets us at our point of need by His Spirit and grants us at this table a new and better affection. When Jesus was lauded by the crowds, Jesus took Himself off to a quiet place and meditated upon the kingdom that will last forever. When He was mocked and abused, He did not curse nor jump to His own defense. Instead, He trusted in Him who takes our fears and carries our burdens. And so when we come to this table, the table of the Lord, please know that we do not need to pretend, posture, or put on a false piety. For Jesus, God's anointed, has stooped down and lived our life and died our death so that trusting in Him and filled by His Spirit, we might taste and see that the Lord is good. For experience will decide how blessed are they, and only they who in the Lord confide. Fear Him, you saints, and you will have nothing else to fear. Make serving Him your sole delight. Your wants shall be his care. And so may it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.